and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple, Come, the the headmaster and... And I guess I guess I should I guess I should go with um, head head of the Praetorians in in the creation of of Venestra and most re most recently manifesting with Deveros in a nutshell. Although with 113 pages, that's one giant nut. Phrasing the one and only Glyes Penfold. How are you doing today or tonight in your case? I'm I'm doing okay. It's nice to be here. It's a very nice temple you have here as well. You paint it yourself. Yeah. Um, contrary to popular belief, I do not paint it with the blood of my enemies. I need more than just red. Red's a vibe. And if I try if I try and paint the walls black, then everybody keeps making Rolling Stone jokes. I mean, uh, red is the new black. So. No, I'm. St I st I still go with I still go with black as much as I can because I like Johnny Cash. Uh, it's good taste. <laughs> although although some of it got although some people ended up making comparisons between me and the Undertaker because tall guy in black. I mean, yeah, I can see it. <laughs> and then the Matrix came along and all and it shifted to Morpheus jokes. And then there'll be another person in a long leather jacket soon enough. Mm -hmm. Oh, but it but it is what it is what it is. I usually I usually just respond with "Speak up, I can't hear you from down there." <laughs> but as is tradition around here, I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, walk with me with regarding your introduction to role-playing games and what about it made it stick? Oh, so, I guess I never really was into role-playing games much as a kid. It only really hit me before I went to university. I had a friend who came up to me. I was, like, leaving sixth form, like, going to university, and they were like, Hey, Giles, uh, we want to play, like, D&D, &D, so would you be interested in playing? I'm like, sure. Let's let's try this. And we did some research, and we were like, "Oh, there's this thing called Pathfinder, and apparently it's a lot easier to play than D and D." And I know a lot of people right now would be laughing because you know Pathfinder's kind of a lot, a lot more complicated than Five E. Let's let's say. Um, but back then, it was Four E was the main thing, and man, Four E, I haven't played it, but I've heard it's a, a bit of a slog fest to get through. So we were like, "Sure, let's play Pathfinder." Um, got a couple of friends together, I even have one friend in America who we like Skyped in, and yeah, we just started our Pathfinder campaign, uh, it was probably like 10 years ago now, mm -hmm. like 8 years ago, um, and yeah, that lasted for a few years, and then that went hiatus for a bit, and then shifted to 5e, we started playing our own stuff, I picked up the, the GMing sort of table after, after that sort of went on hiatus, and then... Since then, I've been creating Vanestra with my home game since maybe about 2014. Um, and that's where it all began. And now I am deep down the tabletop rabbit hole. Um, Vanestra is not my only, only thing. I made a like so, so tabletop RPG called You Died a little while ago mm -hmm. um, for the Caltrop Core Jam. That was good fun. And I have a, you know, a, a good love for solo tabletop RPGs. But Vanestra is my main focus at the moment and will be for the foreseeable future. <coughs> I can I can dig that. Um would that mean that you became the forever DM? Exactly. We're quite lucky with our group in that we've got two two people that GM, so I, I GM and then my friend Alex also GMs, so we sort of not necessarily take it in turns because it's very much been on on them for the past uh, few years because I've been writing for Nestra and have not time uh, to pair, pair sessions, so I've kind of had to put my campaign on hiatus, but ever since I've been doing playtests for Devoros, that's been kind of picking up again, so we kind of like flip backwards and forwards a bit. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Now, in a normal situation, I, I would I would ask I would ask something something like why why a fantasy roam, but I'm kind of past that threshold because because this isn't because as I told as I told you before when we were setting this up, this is not my first rodeo when it comes to ro- when it comes to Roman punk, for lack mm-hmm. of a better term. But I suppose I suppose what I, what I'll ask instead is from your perspective, what do you think is the appeal of of ancient of ancient Rome as um, as a means to create a setting? I it's a tough question. I would say Rome is like it's iconic, right? When you talk about the ancient world, um at least in sort of like the Western world, it's very much Rome is there as the kind of like the the go to thing that a lot of people think of when you mention sort of the classical era and the ancient era. Um I feel it's got a very defined cultural aesthetic to it as well, and it laid the groundwork for a lot of modern culture, and there's a lot of touchstones with Rome, you know, like the way they, they did politics um, has a lot of, the way they did sort of legal affairs and all that kind of stuff was very much, but we still see roots of that in everything today, like legal stuff and like scientific stuff all in Latin, right, or like a lot of it's in Latin, so that's still very, very carries through, so I feel like everyone knows a little bit about Rome, even if they even if they haven't studied it, everyone will know something about Rome. So everyone can not necessarily identify with it in some way, but they can they can have some connection to it. Mm-hmm. And what I for me per, for me personally, I can, I can certainly see that. Oh, I do think I do think that the last few years have been an, have been an interesting turn because. There's been plenty of times when people have di- have dipped into it, but it's always trying to replicate more historical fiction instead of using it as a basis to do something inspired by it, but definitely its own thing. Um, i i kind of I kind of liken it to the difference between r- trying to run a feudal Japan campaign and trying to run a Legend of the Five Rings campaign, which has elements but isn't trying to be that. <clears throat> And, and of course, of course, um, given given the fact that given the fact that you had that you had asked um what what people's favorite emperor was in that in that query for the uh, raffle that you're doing, um, mm-hmm. I would it be would it be out of would it be out of line for me to suggest that you had already been you had already been an enthusiast when it comes to researching that pe- that period of time. I say the Roman Republic era, yes. Um, so in sixth form, I took ancient history, and that's where I kind of was first introduced to Rome on a more kind of in-depth level. So we've like read Caesar, read Tacitus, read Cicero, and kind of you know the big, mm-hmm. the big names. Um, and my memory is like awful, so I don't retain a lot of memory for that. But I it sort of planted the seed of interest in Rome and. That very much got me uh, watching lots of YouTube channels about it. Like, I don't classify myself a historian. If if anyone calls me a historian, they're completely wrong. I'm just someone who has an interest in Rome and like history as a general. But I, I I'm not a knowledge base for it. So whenever I'm writing this, or whenever I'm kind of researching for the for Vanessa and Deboros, I, I'm very much going and like actively researching it uh, and then picking up the information as I'm writing. And then usually it slips out of my mind after I like put it into my universe. Um, trying to get better at retaining it, but yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> I have a lot of respect for historians who actually do this as a job, um, and like keep all that info in their minds. Mm-hmm. Uh, and truth, truth be, t- I I do remember sent. I do remember um, sending you sending you a link to A B Alpha Beta, who does a lot of. A lot of stuff with old languages, and I think you got a kick out of a Latin version of Biggest Dickus. Yeah, I mean, it's everyone knows Monty Python, right? <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> one of the things I got when we started advertising on Facebook a bit. People would just quote that the entire time. And I, was, I feel that's like 
I said people have a touchstone to roam. I swear that's probably like 6% of people's touchstone to roam is <laughs> Monty Python. Well, truth be told, my um, the material that I was using it to to prep my mindset when I, when I did, when I was get when I was setting up for this interview was not biggest dick. I just I just like using that as a gag. Oh. Uh, no, but instead but instead I decided to go with I decided to go with something a bit more ridiculous. That being the Caligula movie. <laughs> I have heard of this film, I've not watched it, but I have heard lots of people talk about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. It is terrible, but it is terrible, but it is terrible in a so bad it's good way, and if nothing else, it's it's one of the rare cases where you'll see Peter O'Toole drunk off his ass. It's on, it's on my list to watch, and I feel like after this interview I do need to go and watch it, because, yeah... Caligula was a a fun guy, uh, and I just feel him paired with this kind of very bad but good film just can only go right. <laughs> Pretty much, ah, uh, it he's pl he's played by Malcolm McDowell, and there was I remember when I, I remember when I was pitched when somebody had asked me how I would handle doing a Judge Dredd movie, I had said. Um, base it on the day the law died, and and ha and ca which has a Judge Cal, which was a parody of Caligula, and ca and cast Malcolm McDowell in the role as an in joke. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, but truth be told, truth be told, if some if somebody were to press me for my introduction to um to Rome, some people might bring up gladiators. Some people might bring up. Um, so, something similar for me. Um, it was through the Total War games. I never played. I never played Medieval or Shogun back in the day, but I did play Rome. Uh, same. I mean, that was one of my first um, first games I ever played. I think the first game I ever played was Age of Empires Two, and then after that, I got Rome Total War on disc back when that was a thing mm -hmm. for PC games. And yeah, I remember sitting in my dad's office um, late into the night playing Rome Total War. That was. Very very fun game. Yeah, I think it was just fun getting the elephants and just having them charge through <laughs> lines of armies. Uh, <laughs> young me was very very fascinated by that. <coughs> but, e but even 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 w even with that, uh, I will I will admit I will. I will ad I will admit that think that things like Gladiator ha have their have their inf have their influences, um, especially especially since a long time ago I ran I ran a I ran a camp I ran a campaign where the player characters were managing gladiatorial stables. Well, oh. I think I thought I thought it'd be a good way to in to integrate the idea of uh, ma of managing a sports team for the for the pl for the players and use that as a parallel to um br to bring them in. I mean, yeah, that's a, a pretty cool like plot hook, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to Deveros, you describe it as a you describe it as a city campaign. So, would it be fair of me to say that? A lot that a lot of it, a lot of it is a lot of it leans into, for lack of a better term, urban fantasy, in the sense that it, in the sense that you're get, you're going to be in this particular city at ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah, um, that's kind of the intent of it. So it originally started as like, I want a quick guide for my players at my home game. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was only meant to be like fifty pages at most. Um, which for me is not much when I write, but it kind of spiraled into a much bigger thing um, as it's now being kickstarted, which I was never the original intention. But yeah, it was very much as a small city setting, um, and that just kind of like ballooned. Uh, and then I realized, oh, I need to explain all this lore through the world. So now I'm making like the world of Vanestra setting, which is like 
the pre face book that has all the information about the world and the gods and like the ember system and how what embers are and all that kind of stuff um but the, all, the whole intention of it was just to make devros as a city um and it's like 20 districts locations and you are in the city like you said 99 percent of the time um mm -hmm. i love urban settings like my, well, my first introduction to urban settings was the curse of the crimson throne in pathfinder um, didn't get too far into it, but it really sparked an interest in like, oh, you can just make a city as a setting, and that's the entire campaign, and that's really cool. Yeah. Um, oh, I can I can certainly understand I can certainly understand that, and, not, and um, I know a, I know a lot of people have the mindset that sit that um city settings sh shouldn't work shouldn't work with fantasy, but. When you consider some of the massive cities that are sh that are shown in c in countless fantasy works, it do it do it wouldn't take much to to um make to make the transference. Yeah, it's like there are lots of fancy cities that you could transfer into like a setting quite easily. I think, mm -hmm. uh, like if you just drop someone in the middle of New York. There is more than enough to keep you occupied there for probably the rest of your life. Um, so why not the same in a D and D campaign? You know. Oh. Uh, especially, especially since with cer with certain with certain si certain cities and the like, there's always going to be the mindset of people wanting to head to the city to try and make it, and re and realizing that. That trying to make it is easier said than done. Yeah, exactly. Like Devros is very much the equivalent of Rome in the Aldaran Empire. It's like it's the capital. It's the center of the Aldaran culture. Everyone has this kind of grandiose view of you know the Devrosian life uh, and living as a Devrosian because it's like sure the the same as like. The, the Italian people and then Romans and it's like if you're a Roman citizen you're you're seen as like quite high you're seen as like that status symbol it's the same with Devros like Devrosians people who live the Devros life are seen as they, they've made it they've got this great great life that they live um, and people from all the provinces you know would come over to try and get some semblance of that. They might be Aldarian citizens, but they're not true Devrosians yet until they've mm. lived the city. Mm-hmm. <coughs> and if, given that given that, would it be even though even though a lot of it is a lot of this book would focus on the city, I'm guessing that there's still some out there's still some outside regions that are adjacent to it that are going that are going to be explored. Yeah, so I, I've done a section in the book called the Devros Locality, so it covers like a 25 kilometer radius around Devros and some points of interest. Um, it doesn't really go into massive amounts of detail about each of the points, there may be like a few paragraphs each about these areas, um, but they're like, if you travel 20 kilometers to the north, there's Breveka, which is like a uh, like industrial town that supplies Devros with a lot of marble and timber, um, and there's like a fishing village to the south, which has like his own stuff going on, and then there's like a pirate cove uh, for the Brevain Pirates to the north, which is like a old legionary fort that was taken over, and they're having real problems with the pirates at the moment. Um, yeah, so th there's a lot of like stuff to do around the city as well, and you've got like the the outer districts. There's like a Grizo, like the vineyard districts, um, which has fun thing about Agrizo is that it was so big on the city map that um, Janice and I, Janice our cartographer who did the city map, um, we had to split it up, I think, into eight separate wards to make it fit on the page, uh, on the pages of the book. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, there's a lot to do around the city, uh, not just inside it. I remember, <clears throat> I remember a long time ago reading, reading a comment that, um, that Pondsmith had made about the creation of Night City in Cyberpunk, and he he um com he made an allusion to the to theme parks, different areas having different themes. Mm -hmm. Within your within within De within Deveros, 
do you have do you have do you have a similar not exactly the same mindset but something not far off of eat of different areas of the city having their own identity yeah 100 percent. so i went into it with the mindset of you know i built it from day one so i was like this was founded in this year by these people and this was like the political structure at that time and i went through like the decades not maybe that granular but like every 50 or so years and i was like how did the city expand what districts were formed what was the reason behind them forming what purpose do they serve and sort of where is the city spread so you've got this kind of divide of the kind of very opulent north side of the river which is very political and very driven by the imperial family who still have influence over the city um despite not being in power anymore and you have sort of as you get gradually more south you get the uh poorer districts um and the more densely compacted districts um so there's definitely a, an identity to each of the districts um, as you travel through, and there is like blending as well, like on the corners of districts. You can there's no like defined line. We actually had a lot of discussion when we we're doing the city map of like actually where are these districts? Like where where do we draw this line? Because the the person who lives in the city is not really going to have a concept of I cross this street and I'm in another district. They're just very much like well this sort of area is the Marmoros district and this sort of area is the Fluminous district. Um, so yeah, that was quite interesting to explore. Mm-hmm. <coughs> and with the, with that in mind, since since one of the backgrounds is um is po- is Publis, essentially a politician, mm-hmm. it's meant it's mentioned that the it's mentioned in that that there's three political parties: the reformist, the revitalist, and the ca- and the captains. Um, yes. What could you tell me about? About eight, about each of their directions. So, you have yeah, the, the, they are the, the three main uh, political groups, um, and I always get the reformists and the revitalists mixed up. So, hopefully, I get it right. Um, the reformists are seeking reform, so they're based on like Caesarian politics or mm-hmm. populares, you know, wanting. To give more power to the people, um, and you know, land land reforms and taking stuff away from the patricians and giving it to the people, like giving it to veterans as they've been promised, like part of their legionary service. So they're very liked by the the common folk. Um, you have the revitalists. You want to revitalize the old empire. So, despite the Aldaran Empire being called an empire, it is actually not an empire. It is a uh, it is an imperial crown republic, so they have the imperial family as kind of the figureheads, mm-hmm. um, but they don't have any power apart from signing from legislature. Um, so they want to reinstate the imperial family as the actual de facto leaders. They want to basically bring back the emperor, mm-hmm. um, and they very much an older form of um, politician, and they're for under the optimates from like Rome. Mm-hmm. And then there's the Capitans, who are my personal favorite. Um, they're kind of like the hooliganistic side of the uh, the reformists. Um, they are led by the demigod of walls, Capitola. Um, and they basically are based out of a, a tower called uh, Capitola as well. It's named after him. Um, and it's just kind of like a party club. Lots of debauchery. Uh, you know, wine. Uh, so Bacchus's is wet dream. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, essentially. Um, anything you can think of, like carnal desires and all that kind of stuff. But then the thing is, they're like really progressive in that sense, in that they want you know more rights for sex workers. They want to give like tax relief to the vineyards, and so they're progressive, but in a very like we're doing it for our own personal gain kind of way. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're kind of seen as. They're one of the smaller parties because they're not really taken very seriously, but they do have like they do bring a lot of good ideas to the table, which is why they still exist as a party in the city. Yeah. Um <clears throat> Now, when it comes to when it, com- when it comes to the state when it comes to the state of things, is the, is the em- since you mentioned the whole the whole thing with the emperor, I'm guessing that he that the emperor and subsequently the imperial family is more 
is is more of a fi is more of a figurehead slash steward role instead of a role that has a that has actual pull in uh, politics. Yeah, so um, you have uh, the the emperor who is currently called Emperor Loxus the Third. Um, he recently came into sort of his position. His mother died a few years ago, um, mm -hmm. protecting the city. She sacrificed herself with her ember and like self sacrifice kind of thing to resurrect a load of people to defend the city. Um, and he's kind of stepped into power, and he's very much in tune with the. Um, reformist and the people, he's very much for the people and he's very much uh, a legionary guy, he uh, is a general, he's leading the, the legions in the north at the moment in the, in the war against Yggdrasil, and mm -hmm. he's very much disliked by the revitalists who want to they, they want to reinstate his power but he doesn't want it uh, and they kind of dislike him because of that and they want to put his sister in power because his sister is much more aligned towards reinstating imperial power, but he's just like fuck it, I want a drink uh, I want to, I want to, you know, fight the war, and I just want to have a good time. Um, and yeah, so he sees um, himself more. He sees himself as a general first before an emperor. Very much so. Yeah, very much a general. Very much a soldier. Um, not even necessarily a general. He sees. He wants to be seen as one with the people, um, and the people respect him for that, and that's why he's he's liked so much. Um, and he, he does have some sort of power, like there is a, a position on the uh, in the Consentium, which is the equivalent of the Senate, mm -hmm. um, where he gets like to oversee and have a vote, but he gets a vote as a person, not as an emperor. Um, but that is like his right, he, as mm -hmm. you know, just happening to be from the imperial family, he gets that right to vote. Um, so yeah, he has a bit of sway, but nothing overly so. Um, but the people like him, so they listen to him, and he can sway them in that way instead <laughs> through his yeah. through his heart and through his words. <clears throat> which pro which probably which probably annoys some certain f certain factions because because of the fact that he has that that um he has that sway. Exactly. Yeah, he's very charismatic. Um, he he was kind of modeled a little bit after Caesar, but. Uh, there was actually a character that we did model entirely after what happened with Caesar, um, who was the entire reason the Imperial family fell. Um, we kind of flipped Roman history on its head a bit, and instead of kind of Republic going into Empire, it was Empire that then got kind of reformed into a Republic thanks to a civil war. Mm -hmm. um, so that similar sort of like tangent, but we just kind of like completely flipped the timeline. I can I can certainly get behind that. Now you mentioned Ember, and that's that's one of the that's one of the big player facing mechanics within within the game. So yep. what so what is what is Ember, and how, and um, what's and what is the goal with what it's supposed to bring to bring to the table? So more law wise or more mechanically. Um, let's st let's start with lore and then lean into mechanics. Sure. So, lore-wise, um, to skim over like several thousand years of like world history uh, as quickly as I can, basically there was uh, cataclysm. Demigods rose up from the underground after being stuck under there for several thousand years, got rid of the cataclysm, and in doing so, they sacrificed themselves. Um, their souls got frayed, and in the way souls work in the Venestri universe, they're formed of threads, which represent threads of fate. Mm -hmm. So a strong soul has many threads of fate in it, and if you take one of those threads, that's sort of a path that your life could lead. Um, and they basically, all their threads got scattered across the, the medial plane, which is the equivalent of the material plane. Mm -hmm. um, and when people rose from the underground to start, you know, recolonizing and re sort of inhabiting the surface, um, these deific threads kind of got woven into the souls of the people. Um, so, as the years progressed, these deific abilities began to manifest in people, um, depending on which soul threads, sort of their family lineages, they got passed through families, um, sort of they, they had. Um, so they're very much a sort of binding to a god, 
the and the, the gods didn't die; they kind of ascended um, into actually being the new pantheon. So these gods still exist, and they have ties to the people that bear their soul threads. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not necessarily a willing binding. It's like you just happen to have that god's thing. So you could have like the, an, a god of shadow and darkness, but be a very virtuous and righteous person, um, and have those sort of shadowy abilities. Um, and the whole mechanical side of it was, I really wanted to give players a bit more customization. Um, they started like right when I began running 5e uh, for my table. I just wanted to give players a bit more like individual customization for their characters um, that they could personalize a bit. It's like I want to be a paladin, but I want to have like some magical uh, like, nature abilities or something like that, or I want to be a uh, a fighter, but I want to be able to slip in like a rogue and have like like small elements of that without having to like multi class. Especially um, since multi classing is pardon my French, a fucking minefield. It's, yeah, especially for new players, although saying that Embers is definitely not for new players, it's it's the reason I've said it's optional in the rule set and in the Vanessa setting is it's not the easiest system to introduce new players to. If you're familiar with 5e, all the mechanics of it will be very familiar to people, but um, in if you're new to 5e, I, I recommend people don't like jump straight into it. Um, Another reason was I found, like, especially in the early levels, uh, bonus actions and reactions really go unused, um, like, 90% of the time. So I want... The reason you'll see a lot of embers of bonus action activation is for that reason. Like, to give people stuff to do with their bonus actions that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Mm-hmm. Um, just giving, like, players agency and options. Um, and also, you know, People like customizing their characters and embers manifest as tattoos and it yeah. can be whatever you want it to look like. <laughs> so you can have some badass like dragon down your arm, uh, one of the characters from my um my home campaign. She is very much like wild magic, so she just has like random objects appearing on her arm and every time a new wild magic thing happens, that like manifests on her ember. Um I'm pretty. I'm. I'm pretty sure I know a few Issei Zumi pl- players back in the day who'd get who could ma- who could make some interesting things out of this because, well, Issei Issei Zumi in um in L in L five R are basically tattooed monks. Sure. Yeah. I I could see people getting very creative with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am very deliberately releasing the Ember system as open game content as well, so other people can take it and make content with it. And um, well, there was that Tome of Mystical Tattoos th- um, supplement that ca- that came out not too long ago that had some interesting designs. I've not heard of that one, and that sounds really interesting. I just love like tattoo magic. There's like a whole like feet tree I think in Pathfinder that's like tattoo magic, which I think. My only sparked the idea for Embers a long while, while back in the back of my mind. Um, yeah. But sort of just like cool. I know a lot of people love it as well. Um, mm-hmm. But one question that I did have regarding the regarding the Ember abil- regarding Ember abilities is: Is it a case where where you're pi- where you're picking a passive major, uh, minor and de- and devotion or? How how would how would the creation of one's um one's ember and the development of it work? Sure. So it starts at level two. I have to give you a bit of time to familiarize yourself with the character. Because I find when I start playing a character, I never know what that character is going to be like until I play them for a few sessions. Even if I've written out a page of backstory and I know how I'm going to role play them, it never ends up being what I thought it was. Um, so it's it's it starts at level two. You pick in the default. And like in in the full release, there'll be like different um, setting types that the GM can choose um, based on how powerful they want the players to be. But you pick, I think, one passive and one minor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and passives are just like a skill a proficiency or a small like one temp HP at the start of your turn kind of thing. Just something that ticks in the background. Um, and then minors are equivalent to I think second or third level spells. Um, and then majors you get later on, so you'd maybe at level six. So it's every four levels you like upgrade it. Mm. Um, so second level, then sixth level, then tenth level. I think either sixth or tenth you get a major. 
which are like fifth or sixth level spells. Um, and then as you get into it a bit more, you can also chart embers, which isn't in a nutshell. This is something that's in the main publication. So the whole thing is like the ember feeds off of your soul. It's part of your soul, and you're basically choosing by charring it, you're choosing to give more of your soul over to the god um, and letting it have more control of your body. So mechanically, that's like you sacrifice like maximum hit points to this thing, but it upgrades the abilities um, permanently. So it's like cut glass cannon, um, but you can get some wild stuff from it <laughs> if you choose to do that. <coughs> now, when it comes, one thing that one thing that I was curious curious about, given that given this ability setup, is is it is it a set is it a set of a free form choice of abilities or or is there a set of presets based on the pan based on the pantheon? So I've done a set of presets. So I think there's six passives, six minors, four majors for each of the twenty gods in the release. Um, so that's a lot of abilities. Uh, but those are just presets. I do give guidelines for GMs to create their own, and I actually actively encourage GMs to make their own with their players, because the stuff that's there might not be re representative of what um, what the player might want to do. Um, but typically, when you when you design your ember, you would pick two gods, and then you would choose from the abilities of those two gods. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, Zith, God of Shadow, and Salianthre, God of uh, some Nature. You can have a combination of those two and then play their abilities off of each other. Um, but yeah, I actively encourage people to come up with their own abilities as well. And there are guidelines for making that. It's very much like I want to give freedom to GMs and to players. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that, with that in mind, you mentioned you mentioned that charring. Um, Give, gives more gives more of your soul to that deity mechanically. How would how would that work? Is it a case of reducing your max HP, um, or put or what sort of what sort of drawback would you incur if you ch if you choose to char? Sure. So charring takes place over a long rest, um, and you basically go into a translate state where you begin giving your soul to the ember and allowing it to overtake more of your body. Um, mechanically, the skin on your body begins to burn and look more like it's, um, you know, when you burn paper, it has that kind of like burn ember like effect. It's mm -hmm. kind of like that, kind of ripples across the skin. And the more you char, the more that happens to your skin. Um, and you'd roll some hit die based on what class you spec into. So, um, is that right? I can't remember. It's been through so many iterations now, I can't quite remember what the current iteration is. You basically roll a number of dice, um, which will be reduced from your maximum hit points permanently. Um, I believe you also roll a saving throw, and if you fail that saving throw, you also potentially incur a side effect, such as a reduction in your con, or your strength, or your dex, or some other um, like mental effect, or something like that. It's like mm. the toll it takes on your body. Yeah. Um, so yeah, people who char are kind of seen both as very dangerous because charring really does give you a boost to those abilities. Like they can get very strong through the char, but you are also weakening yourself both mentally and physically through doing it. Um, so yeah, people have different opinions on it in the in the universe as well. And I'm I'm getting. For me, one for me, one of the one of the key things when you have when you have an ability that's meant to be that's meant to have the, those sort of drawbacks is making sure that the benefit is is not ju is not just a slight it's not just a slight change in numbers because if you're if you're playing if you're playing hard if you're playing hardball with your ability scores then you then I think you should get something of similar value out of that. Because yeah. because ability damage, you're not getting that back easy. Yeah, um, it's very much a risk reward thing with embers um, and charring. Like embers themselves, you can just go down embers normally, n ignore charring, and you'll be quite powerful at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Charring is meant to be like you're playing with fire, quite literally, um, and 
you, the rewards are definitely worth it. Like, you can get a lot out of it. Um, a friend of mine, one of the co-designers for this, actually did a whole massive spreadsheet of, like, all the possible hit dice rolls you could get and all the different classes and stuff, and we managed to calculate it just right where you can, like, be powerful from it, but there's also a chance you could die from it as well if you char too much. Um, which I found interesting, and I was keen to keep that in. I, like, would be keen to see, like, a character going down the deep end with charring and, like, almost becoming obsessed with it to their detriment. Mm -hmm. um, like, that mechanically roleplay-wise is, like, super interesting to me. Yeah. And get, given given my experiences with st with with stuff with stuff like double cross or the numerous stuff I've I've dipped in, I've dipped into in the world of darkness or hell the fact that Exalted is one of my favorite games I'm no stranger to risk re to risk reward. Um, yeah. Now one th now um one thing that I'm that I'm curious about whenever you whenever you're doing a very urban setting, is how is how to account for a variety of a, a variety of players and a variety of campaign styles. Mm. And I do I do recall asking this to the Historica Arcanum guys a few months back. But for the, but if somebody if somebody wanted to do some some equivalent to a dungeon delve, um would would that would Devros be able to accommodate that through things like catacombs or under or underground chambers within uh, within the setting? Hundred percent. Yeah, I've deliberately designed some stuff there. So you've got Sanguine Sanctum, which is the um, one of the bases of the Vampiric Order. So we're kind of like <laughs> the Illuminati of this world. They're very much pulling the strings, of everything, um, and they have a sanctum beneath the city, an old Vampiric fort. So there's a load of vampire lore, which I'll actually be delving into in Blood Tides, which is the first published adventure I'll be doing for um, for Vanestra and Devros. Um, so there'll be a lot of that there. Um, there is the Necropolis of Estioch, so um, that is a burial ground where a lot of people in the city are buried, and that goes deep down, and some parts are collapsed. Um, also, a really fun bit that I played around with with one of the what, what was going to be the original first adventure, but it didn't it didn't hit the right vibes I wanted. But it's for like introducing people to the setting, um, mm -hmm. so it kind of got scrapped. But I might release it as a one shot sort of thing later on. Um, but it explores the old sewers. So the city had an old sewer system which in the ninth century collapsed, um, and then it was kind of like part of the city, sort of like almost a cape into it. And there's a colossal effort to rebuild new sewers on top of it and push the old sewers further down um, and there's a lot of stuff still in those old sewers that there's a lot of interesting things down there mm -hmm. um, there is also an ancient hydra <laughs> very deep down under there as well that people might encounter in one of our encounters that is releasing the setting yeah. Um, so yeah there's a lot of stuff under the city um our, well, our cartographer's Janice is actually doing the underground city map at the moment. Um, yeah. Which is... I'm very excited. I just saw a first draft of it today, and it's very, very cool. <laughs> I noticed I noticed that you have quite a few... that you have quite a few kinships or ra or races mm -hmm. within within the preview document. Are each... Are, each, are most of the ones that are listed in there going to, going to get their own details as far as... as far as ability modifiers and, fe and features... So, um, I'd say a large number of them will be just called OG5B, sort of base rules. Um, so they will just point to the base rules. Um, some of them will get new modified stuff based on what we think some sort of these kinships should have. Um, obviously the new ones will have loads of new stuff that have, like, kinship features. Um, I think Dampir is, like, one of my favorite. Um, I know other, other sets have done that here as well, but I wanted to put an extra spin on it, especially with how Vampire and Vampires interact in this universe. Um, yeah. So there, there's a lot to explore with the, the kinships. Um, but I, I'd say maybe 65% of them are probably just like, you, your base 5e, like what you're used to. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to make, I didn't want to like just overhaul everything, I wanted to make people you know familiar with some yeah. of the kinships. 
<coughs> Personally, I, I could I could see how I could see how um some how some of the new entries might be the might be the variations with humans. Yeah, we've done a lot of human variations because one one thing you'll learn about me if you ever play with me at a table is I always it's kind of a running joke now in our our group that I always play humans because to me humans are the most diverse group. Um, I feel people seem to stereotype other kinships quite a lot, like elves and dragonborn seem to have like stereotypes that follow them around a bit. But humans, to me, I don't know, they just kind of fascinate me. Uh, <laughs> I guess it says more about me than anything else. But um... I, um, I'd be lying if I. S there's been a few. T there's been a few times where I've run games and some people have cried foul at me because of the fact that I insisted on when I say. This is a human-only campaign. That doesn't mean hu that doesn't mean humanoid. You're not going to sneak in your elf into this. Mm. And well, from some of the stories I've told you, you already know that I, that if I put my foot down on something, that's not a that's not a discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but the the large reason that the large reason that I do that is it's is um in some in some settings. It's very it's very easy for a character to be unique by just being a not by just being a non-human race. And to me that to me that always felt like a like an like an easy fix. Like try, like trying to put like trying to fix something by using copious amounts of stuff, duct tape. And I I I can I can see that. Like I I I know that people like love playing you know, really eccentric races and kinships and all that kind of stuff, and like it, it never appealed to me personally. I, I feel that I like playing with a character's personality than their outwards appearance of like what their what they look like and their culture and that kind of stuff. I, I just love tweaking the personality of a character, um, which why I just feel comfortable with humans, I guess. Well, I've told I've told people in my class if you're gonna if you're going to do that, then don't. Then don't se don't settle on you be don't settle on just be on just being your ca your character is in it your character is a dwarf or something like that. Um, being being one, a dwarf isn't that personality, right? One one exa one example example that I an example that I often that I often use in this regard is um, oddly enough from Star Trek, and some people would think I'd use Spock in this example. No. The example that I use in in this instance is Worf, because his his persona is especially during Deep Space Nine was not him being a Klingon. In fa in fact, in fact, a lot of what a lot of what he believes is very much at odds with um, Klingon culture, and he's tr and he's trying to find a middle ground between that between between what he wants and what's expected of him. And while that's certainly well, that's certainly a common feature with, um, with with certain with certain characters where their ethnicity is a big part of that, it's not the key thing is that it's not the only part. Much in the same way that Cisco is not the black commander. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm I'm very keen. Like we've got a lot of cultural sensitivity readers and. Um, Oh. Uh, Although on, on the project, so I'm keen to like make it as diverse as possible and give people like those options to like personalize what? their characters outside the stereotypes of yeah one one I've mentioned in the past that one of my favorite characters from um, Robert E Howard is Solomon Kane. Mm -hmm. Oh. And with a, with someone like him, it would be very it would be very easy to begin and end his characterization with him being a Puritan. Except, except in a lot of these story, a lot of the stories involving him, him being a Puritan is is not as is not as important as people might think. Uh, especially since a, l a lot of it is him, is him being the is much like with much like with Howard's other works, him being the traveling Avenger. Um, even, sure. Even even more so than with Co than with Conan or Cole. Mm -hmm. uh, although, since I mentioned dwarves, I'd be I I feel obligated to mention a joke that I that I've 
I've had I've had for the longest time because some because a common question I've got I've gotten asked is if dwarves live underground why do they all why do they always wield axes? The answer: Elves live in trees. <laughs> okay, that's quite good. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> oh. but when it when it comes to further player facing mater materials. Do you have any plans on in, on introducing any new any new subclasses or the like, or is that not in the cards? Yeah, so there are some subclasses. Um, we're actually might we'll be previewing previewing them a little sooner than next year with the Kickstarter. Um, we have a few podcasts that are working with us at the moment to run the late shipments adventure from the, the preview uh, from the nutshell document, mm -hmm. uh, and I know that there is interest in playing a couple of the subclasses. So one that I was very keen to do was the um, Legionarius um, fighter subclass, which I feel 5e lacked a lot of like fighter-centric battlefield control. Um, so the Legionarius subclass very much focuses on making formations with your allies, and get if you're in a certain formation with your ally, you get boons for everyone who's part of the formation. Um, so I think that's going to be a very interesting one that can play into the lore quite heavily for with Neveros. Mm -hmm. um, it's just making sure you have the allies that <laughs> are willing to do formations with you. Um, but there's also a feat that you can take that can give you uh, NPCs from legions that can help you with formations as well. Um, well, the subclasses. We've got the Revel Revelry Cleric. It wouldn't be Rome or Rome adjacent if there wasn't a lot of wine and a lot of festivals and a lot of drinking. Um, so yeah, we have the the Revelry Cleric, which can kind of infuse spells into booze and then give that booze to friends and allies to then cast those spells uh, when they drink the alcohol. Um, and then they have to make a con save to make sure they don't get magically drunk from the spell from like the the spell booze as well. Um, so yeah, those are two of my favorites. I'd say um, mm -hmm. we've got a couple more in there. There's five or six in total. A couple have been cut just because we didn't have time to play test them properly. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in with that in mind, there's there's always a, there's always a question of how, of how of how certain classes can would be would be integrated within the within the lore of of a setting and. Some of them I can see is as easier than others. Mm -hmm. Fight, um, fight, fighters and fighters and rangers are pretty much idiot proof in this regard. Um, same thing with same thing with cleric or druid, also known as Codzilla. But <laughs> how would how would you how would you integrate things like warlocks and monks? So warlocks I would see as cultists. Um, again, using cult in the term of the ancient sort of collective of people who worship a god, um, what we probably know in this day and age as clergy. Um, warlocks would very much fall under sort of the maybe Chthonic cult, so a more underground cult, um, which is what in the modern day we would know just as a cult. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's obviously the heavenly cults, which the clerics and paladins would fall into, um, which would be more of like, you know, the traditionally upheld gods. Mm -hmm. Um Monks, I'm I'm not entirely sure. Um, monks are based like I have never played a monk, and I've not read too much into monks. Um, but they're based around monasteries, and you could probably you could probably work those into into certain cults. Um, I'd say temples, especially like there are mm -hmm. so many temples in this city. Um, yeah, monks could definitely be dedicated to those temples and the cults based around them. Um, it's and bar and barring barring that, you could always d you could always double down on the unarmed combatant and ju and just m and just make them brawlers. Yeah, I mean there are, there are entire there's a whole organization around like brawling. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, there's interesting bits of law there. Like there's a whole section of the city that you're not allowed to spill blood in. It's it's sanct to do so. Um, or like a Roman version of no fighting in the war room. Yeah, pretty much. Um, it's it's 
based on uh, the literal kind of uh, the pomerium of ancient Rome. Um, so you weren't allowed to take weapons into Rome itself uh, within the pomerium, which is called a designated holy area. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a, a, a similar area in, in Devros where you can't take weapons, you cannot cast magic, you cannot uh, spill blood, um, you are not allowed to die. It is against the law to die in there. Um, lots of interesting stuff, but there's a whole brawling group that sneak in after dark to go and brawl in the streets of that area because they can't get a thrill out of the idea of we're doing something we shouldn't. Um, we're spilling blood on this holy, holy land. Um, so, yeah, there's no, no short of brawling as well. Lots of street gangs as well. Um, as with the late Republic of Rome, there were a lot of street gangs and issues with those, so I, I really want to incorporate those into the setting a lot. So mm-hmm. Monk could maybe be part of one of those uh, political street gangs. Um. <coughs> yeah, a good a good way to a good way to in, to integrate the warriors. Oh, <laughs> because well, that, that's one of my favorite movies, so of course I have to reference that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. To the point that I've even, I, but um, I will ad- I will admit when you meant when you mentioned when you mentioned not 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 being allowed to spill blood, the first thing that came to mind is one is a scene a scene that I keep referencing from from the show Peaky Blinders, the whole the whole thing of the whole thing during the we- during the wedding and no fucking fighting. <laughs> yeah, I've seen the gif. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I, I've seen that going around. I still need to watch Beaky Blinders. It's on my list. I've watched the first episode and I loved it, and mm-hmm. I just need to sit down and watch the rest of it. Yeah. Oh. Of course, the sweet irony is that is that a wait is that he ends up bumping into a waiter and ki- and kicking his ass right after telling everyone no fighting. <laughs> yeah. And just comedic timing there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. but. Now with now, I realize thing I realize things are in flux. But what do you sh- what do you think you'd be shooting for as far as the total page count for for the um, Venestra book? Uh, so fun funny fact about that funny story. Um, I did a like I had this, this thing of like a few months ago of like, huh? I don't know how many pages we're at. Starting counting, and as I was counting. I, my face was just getting paler and paler um, as we hit over a thousand pages with it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God. Um, and I, like, had the real concept of what that was like in terms of physicality, of, like, how thick a book would be. So I went and got some of my Pathfinder books, stacked them up, and I was like, oh, that's a really big book. I'm, pretty, not- sh- I'm pretty sure that'd be classified as a weapon by that point, especially if it was hardcover. Yeah, by the tangent, there is a Ember ability called Throw the Book at Them, where you literally summon a book and clobber someone with it. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, um, I, I can't just, like, realize, I can't physically print this. I spoke to the printing company, and it's like, we can't print this. <laughs> like, cost-effectively, we, you, like, you will be losing money printing this book. Um, and we were like, okay, we need to split this. Um, so... It's now, I'm still figuring it out, which is why on, like, the press kit thing on the Vanessa website, it's very, like, question mark out of the final book count, but um, I kind of want to have the world of Vanestra with all the Ember stuff in it, um, and all the gods, and, like, this is the world lore, right? Um, and that's probably going to form at least, like, a good 200 and something pages. Um, and there's going to be, like, the Eldarin Empire book, which is maybe going to be, like, 80, and then... Devros itself, I have tried to split down as much as I can, but I still think that's going to be like a 500-page book. Um, which is still a weighty tome. <laughs> um, and then we've got the Monsters of Devros, which I might rename. Now I've realized I want to split the monsters out into their own books. So that might be Sif's, Sif's Guide to Monsters. Sif is the demigod of adventure who catalogs monsters in the universe. Um... So I want to maybe do Sith's Guide to Monsters as the separate one, and then obviously Blood Tides as the adventure book. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's looking to be five books at the moment, I think, is like the sensible count. Um, but 
but we will see. Well, in lieu, in lieu of jinxing... Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Because... <laughs> You know, you know, you know as well as en as well as anyone that nothing ev that nothing ever goes according to plan. It never does. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. oh, just a fifty-page book. It'll be but, fine. Four years later. Oh God, there are a thousand pages. <laughs> when I was working insurance, that there would be there would be people who'd come in and unironically say I wasn't planning on having an accident. <laughs> I know you might be tilting your head at that at that statement, but that's but that's what people would say right in front of me. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if I ever have to on insurance, I am now saying that with full seriousness to someone, just to see what they react with. Well, you can't do that around you can't do that around me because I'm gonna because I'd be giving you shit for it all day. <laughs> Thankfully, you're not my insurance in private yeah. either, though. So. <laughs> but. Then again, I give everybody shit. I hold these truths to be self-evident that all are cremated equal. <laughs> but with all of that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to whether it's to further Talk, whether it's to further talk about the development of of Vanestra, or just to just to shit just to shit po just to shit post at anybody who's a fan of Hannibal, yeah. uh, the door is always open. As I often Thank say you. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Of course. Thank you for having me. It's been great being here, and I'll definitely have more to say about Devros and Vanestra next year when we do the Kickstarter. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>